So my name is Madeline Loria. I am an account executive for Meetup Retail in the Americas office. Our headquarters is in Boston. Um, and joining me is Hilbert. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, so my name is Hilbert. Um, I work from the same office as Madeline. I work from Boston. Um, and in the last few years, I've been working a lot with retailers in North America and help them with their RFID journey. Uh, and very happy to talk to you today about uh, uh, labels in the world of RFID. And good morning, Pete. Hi, uh, first of all, thanks to the NEDAP team for inviting me along today. I'm Pete Moylan from AV Denison, and in my role as Market Development Director for UK and Scandinavia, I get to help retailers improve their stock file accuracy, improve availability, help them to sell more products at full price, mark down less, and ensure their products are there when their customers need them. So before we get started, I just want to go over a few house rules. Just to let you know, this webinar will last around 30 minutes. We do have a Q&A section at the end of the webinar. So if you have any burning questions that come up during the presentation, please drop those in the Q&A bucket on the Zoom screen. Uh, we will be doing three polls. And if you see the poll pop up on your screen, just choose the answer that is uh, best for you. And then we will be recording this webinar as well. So if you'd like to share it with colleagues, it will be up on our website within the next day. Um, and feel free to like and share on our social media platforms. So what are we talking about today? We often get questions from our customers or from retailers around what's the best strategy for me when it comes to source tagging? Or what is the best label for me depending on the functionalities that are important to my RFID deployment? Well, we'd like to take a moment and cover some of those questions uh, with our expert Pete on the line. So we're gonna just dive right in. Hilbert, can you please introduce who is NEDAP? Yes, yeah, so NEDAP is a uh, technology company headquartered in the Netherlands uh, with offices all around the world. Uh, we already mentioned the Boston office, which is our North American headquarters, but we also have offices all over Europe and offices in, in Asia to support the retailers that we work with globally. Um, and NEDAP has been in the uh, retail industry for around 40 years already. Uh, and in the world of RFID, we focus predominantly on the software and we have also a background in RFID hardware. So I think that um, we can share some of those experiences that we have had, that we have learned with, uh, with all of you today. Thank you, Albert. And Pete, who is Avery Dennison? So uh, Avery Denison is a very large um, label organization. I work in the um, Avery Denison Intelligent Label Division, and we're a global leading tech company focused on giving all products a unique digital identity. And we can use uh, various digital triggers to do that, be it a uh, high quality, high performing RFID label, NFC tag, or a simple QR label. Um, to enable access to the identity. And these are used both in the supply chain and uh, in store, but also accessed by consumers who might want to access other data about a product, where it was made, what sizes are available, and allow the brand owner to connect directly with their consumers, both before and after purchase. Thanks, Pete. Before we dive into the real content of the webinar, I wanna ask a poll to the audience just so that we can get a baseline of everyone's knowledge of RFID. Um, so the question is, are you using RFID today? And your options are, yes, I'm using RFID in some of my stores. No, I do not use RFID today. Or yes, I have deployed RFID across my organization. So I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to see these responses coming in. So far, yes, I have deployed RFID and my organization is in the lead. I'll give you a few more seconds. And I'm going to end the poll and share the results with you. So we have a nice, pretty even split between the three options, um, but 53% of you have deployed RFID in the organization. So that's great. So we're here to share with you a little bit more about the label innovations and how labels have uh, grown and how they've diversified throughout the years. Um, and for those of you who do not use RFID or in some of your stores, we hope that this will be some valuable information. So let's dive in. 
I think a few years ago, not that many, we were thinking of RFID as a barcode replacement, but there were limited functionality. So when we think about how we use RFID, and we're talking about RAIN RFID, there's a few functionalities that are of great benefit. That's bulk reading. You're now able to scan multiple articles and very quickly and at a distance. So we say that you can count around 20,000 labels per hour. That's much faster than if you were to go around scanning each barcode. And we can even scan through boxes. So you can scan a box that's coming into your store through goods receiving process and understand exactly what's in that box before you even open it. And we're making each item unique. It's no longer just this black t-shirt. It's actually a, this specific black t-shirt that has gone through production. So we are track and tracing items all the way from source to store on an individual basis. So for those of you who already know that about RFID, just that was a quick summary, but I will hand it over to you. Pete, can you talk to us about the RFID inlay? Okay, so uh, let, let's look at the key components of the RFID inlay. Um, we have the silicon chip and there are a few suppliers of these in the market all comply with a common ISO standard. Some have extra features. Uh, this chip contains memory, uh, where we typically write the product code plus the unique serial number, and this is where it gets its unique identity, what we call the EPC, electronic product code. Then we have the antenna, which is a conductive geometric shape, and this is tuned to a defined frequency. Uh, this design is critical to the to performance. The antenna, harvests energy and when the tag moves into an RF field and that energy powers the tag while it's in the field. There's no battery on the tag and that's why the tags are called passive tags. The tags are tuned to function at ultra high frequency at about 866 megahertz in the EU and at between 902 and 928 megahertz in the US. And those frequencies are set by local telecommunications authorities. And the tags can uh, be read from a few feet to several meters away and are really well suited for the supply chain and store operations where we need to be able to read a lot of tags very quickly. There are several materials uh, the antenna can be made of. Most commonly in the market, it tends to be aluminum. And then this inlay sits on various uh, types of carrier. Typically then, this inlay is laminated into your point of sale labels or tickets. Um, it's normal practice to print the RFID logo onto your label uh, to inform not only uh, the consumers that you're using the technology, uh, but it's also useful for your own store staff. And I'll say more about that later. Uh, these labels and tickets are made into rolls and sheet forms, and they're typically fed through printers which print on the variable data and then they encode this EPC into your tag. Um, product code plus serial number, okay? So we would typically read the tags with a fixed reader or your store staff might read them with a mobile handheld, that's the most common case. And those readers send out an RF transmission and the inlay, as I say, harvests power from that RF signal and it also receives instructional data and that the standard instruction would be uh, to ask the tag to respond uh, with its electronic product code. Okay. So the RFID Inlays can be provided in uh, a range of different tags and formats, most commonly in labels and tickets. Uh, but we're seeing more and more demand uh, for them to be in sewing fabric labels, as you see there down there on the right hand corner. And as we've expanded into more categories, particularly retail, uh, we've seen several new challenges in those areas and, and it's driving a lot of new product developments. So um, how the chips evolved. The uh, key evolutions really can be divided into chip and inlay developments. The chips have become progressively more sensitive. 
requiring less and less energy to switch them on and respond to the reader. And this helps inlay manufacturers like us to create tags which are therefore easier to read from further distance. We measure that uh, sensitivity in uh, decibel milliwatts, uh, dBm, and in 2003 we had about minus six dBm, and now in 2020 we're, we're up around 24 dBm. And if you consider that uh, three dBm would increase your read range by perhaps 35% or more. Um, it's provided a really significant impact on store and supply chain read range performance and counting is you know, simply much, much faster. We've also moved from simple 64-bit read-only chips uh, where we made an association between the product code and that license plate on the chip uh, to now where we have fully writable 96-bit chip which is aligned with global ISO and GS1 encoding standards. And um, again, that encoding standard includes exactly how you encode the GTIN and your, your serial number. We can now electronically lock the tag with an access pass code. We can perma lock the tag so you can never change the ID. And we can also kill the tags. And some of the chip manufacturers have added additional user memory for additional data. Um, added privacy features to temporarily put areas of memory to sleep. And uh, some chips have been released with only very minimal functionality, basically to reduce the cost, because a lot of those other features simply weren't being used. One of the most significant uh, developments has been around the auto-tune self-adjusting features that are now built into several of the chips, uh, which really account for the antenna's environment. So you may have a small tag that will work well in the EU or the US frequency bands, but not often consistently well across both frequency bands, which might mean you need a different tag for a different part, uh, different market. And so for those of you who, who are global retailers, um, this is, becomes an issue because uh, you can not always know the uh, final market destination of that product um, before, it, before it, you know, it finally ships. And the auto tune function allows the tag to basically maximize its sensitivity over a broader band. So you could use the tag in, in both, both environments. Uh, we're also seeing uh, the European Etsy uh, Commission Authority open up uh, an RFID frequency in the same band as part of the same band as the US between 915 and 921 megahertz. It's being referred to as upper Etsy. And um, the headline is essentially that if you are a global retailer uh, or brand owner, uh, this is very useful development because if you are using a small tag in both the US and EU market, now you might only need to use that US tag because uh, it would work well in both environments and the hardware guys um, are, are modifying the kit to accommodate this upper Etsy. Note that not every country is bought into it yet in the EU. It's a typical EU scenario where things take a while for us all to agree. In terms of inlays, there are now more and more tags designed for um, challenging materials like on metal surfaces, um, in homeware or personal care like on aerosols, on fluids, cosmetics, and also, uh, particularly in homeware, uh, tags which could be microwavable. So, but maybe by accident, someone's not removed the label, stick it in the microwave to defrost. And uh, we're also seeing some retailers asking for dual technologies in the same tag. So UHF and high frequency uh, technologies in the same tag. Um, manufacturers are also moving towards more sustainable conversion techniques, investing in uh, creating tags uh, that can enter domestic recycling um, and also creating cleaner pulps and reducing the use of, of some substrates. The quality has also improved dramatically and um, you know we see a huge impact on your ROI if you if your tags aren't of very high quality. So Hilbert, um, can you share some uh, key examples of how these technical evolutions have unlocked some new use cases for retailers? Yes, thank you, Pete. I, I would like to highlight three use cases that we have seen uh, being introduced in the market in the last few years and where those new tech evolutions 
uh, really made um, unlock those use cases. So I want to talk about some of the new cool privacy features and how we have seen those being used in a retail environment. I'm going to talk a little bit about best practices regarding password protection. And then the last one, I want to talk about some on, uh, new use cases that are unlocked with the highest sensitivity of the labels. So let's start with the, with the privacy features. Um, I think Peter already mentioned those, the, those privacy features that are now on some of the most recent uh, chipsets. Um, and what you can do with that is that you can, uh, once you activate those privacy settings, you can reduce the read range so that you can only read it from a, from a very near distance in that, instead of a larger distance that you would typically have with an RFID label. And you want that, for instance, to happen as soon as you have sold that item so that when the person is leaving the store that, it's, that you can no longer identify the item, that you can no longer read the label from a larger distance and you need to be very close to the label to read the, to read the, the, the chip and to basically undo the uh, effect and if you want to make it uh, readable from a larger distance. So retailers that have been adopting this have been doing that at the point of sale. So at the point of sale, they give a command to the label and then reduce the read range. You could also thinking, you could also be thinking to do that at the EAS. So you may have a reader at the exit to register which items are leaving the store. The sold items that are leaving the store, you will then activate those privacy settings and re reduce the read range of that specific label that now left the store. Then the second thing, Peter already talked about, password protecting your labels. Of course, you don't want uh, a stranger uh, uh, walking into the store, having the capability of rewriting uh, the, the EPC, the code that you have encoded onto the RFID label. And even worse, you don't want them to kill the label, uh, um, which is a, uh, uh, something you cannot undo. So once a label is killed, you cannot use it anymore. So that's why you want to protect the label. And with the recent labels, that's of course possible. And you can do that with a static password, means that the password is uh, set for that specific label and it is the same for all the labels within your organization. But that's quite easily hackable. So if you know that password, you can then change, and the password is the same for all the labels, you can then change the, the encoding in all the labels or even worse, you can then kill all the labels if you have the kill password. So one way to solve that is to use a one-way hash. And with a one-way hash, you're basically enabling every label to have a unique password that's depending on the EPC, on the, label, on the encoding that's on the label. And using the hash and that, uh, so the hash code and that EPC, you can unlock the password and then reprogram the label or kill the label if you want to do that. And then last innovation that I think has been the, the biggest innovation, the biggest change we have seen in RFID, in the RFID world is the uh, uh, reduced sensitivity. So you need less and less power to uh, read the label and to turn, on the, to, to turn on the label. And that unlocks some really cool new use cases in the retail environment. For instance, you can use RFID for EAS. So you can track which items are leaving the store and which items are, are paid. And if the item is not paid, you will make an alarm. So EAS stands for electronic article surveillance. Another use case where you need this, this larger distance between the reader and the label is for instance, for instance a transition station where you uh, uh, are tracking the item movements from the back of house to the front of house. Uh, and that's another cool use case, another cool example of a, a, a possibility that you now have with these more sensitive labels. So we are very curious to uh, get some input from you about which of those tech evolutions you find most uh, important. So let's go to the next poll. And the question is, which tech evolution will have the biggest impact on your business? So again, please fill in your answer. The first option is password protection or privacy. The second one is the reduction in read distance. Then the green labels, and the last one, the increase in label sensitivity to unlock new use cases. So while we're, while we're waiting for these responses to come in, I have a quick question for you. What have you seen in the market as something that's been adopted most out of the, the impacts that you just outlined for us? That's a good question. So I think the, the, 
we definitely see that more and more use cases in the retail environment are unlocked. And I think that this, the sensitivity plays a, a big part in that, uh, or the reduced sensitivity plays a big part in that. Um, and I, I probably should say not reduced sensitivity, I should say increased sensitivity. But um, uh, so the labels we have become more sensitive and that unlocks the, those new use cases. And I think that's, that's something we have definitely seen that retailers are thinking beyond just the cycle counting that they typically do in the, in the, uh, in the stores. Okay. So let's, uh, I think everybody had the time to respond. So let's end the poll and show, share the results. Um, the majority of you agree with what I just said is that the, the, the increase in label sensitivity has the biggest impact on their uh, um, retail industry. Uh, interestingly, interestingly, the password protection and privacy was not selected by anyone. So I think that's an interesting, interesting finding. So um, let's go to the next slide and let's have a look at the typical read points within a retail supply chain. Obviously, there are more read points, but those are the read points that we have seen being adopted the most. So the, the supply chain very simplistically exists of the factory, the DC, the store and the customer. So let's have a look at the factory. So once the product is made and the label is applied, you ship that item to, the, to your DC. So, but before you ship it, you wanna verify did I pack the right items? And you can do that with a scan pack verification. Um, and this read point is a read point at the factory. It could be the first read point in the supply chain, but there could also be one read point before this. And that's basically the creation of the label, either when you print the label in that factory or when you do that in the service bureau. So that's basically the creation of the label could be the first read point. And then the scan pack verification would be the second read point within your supply chain. So, and then the products are sent to the DC. And in the DC, two read points that we see most often being adopted is inbound and what we call the scan pack, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, packing verification. So did I pack the correct items that I'm now about to ship? Um, so you want to make sure you read that at the moment you can still intervene. So if somebody made a mistake, you can still correct that mistake. Um, so the first one, an internal at the inbound is verifying that I received the correct uh, merchandise that I, I am expecting that's noted on the shipping notice. And the second one, am I sending the right items to my uh, retail partners, to my source, or for instance, when it's an e-com order, did I send the right items to the customer that's ordering from that PC from the website? And if you add those read points, you can connect all those read points to the EPCS repository. And that's the, EP, the, the layer that will contain all those different read points and provide that full supply chain transparency. So then the items arrive in the store and then the first read point is in, in, in the goods receiving. So quickly scanning a box and checking, did I receive the correct items uh, out of that box? So, and then the, moving to the second read point in the store, I think that's the read point that we have seen being adopted the most over the last few years. And that's also think where I, what's a very logic starting point for most retailers because this will bring your ROI for RFID and that's cycle counting. So improving your stock accuracy by not taking inventory once or twice a year, but doing it maybe on a weekly basis or on a daily basis even, uh, by quickly taking inventory using RFID. Now you, have, now you make sure that you have the right products available. So now somebody can buy that product. So when somebody wants to buy that product, uh, you um, uh, can also use RFID at the point of sale. First of all, to make sure you have that other read point and have that complete visibility in that EPCS repository. So to complete that journey. But on the other side, you can also replace your existing barcode process with an RFID reader to speed up the uh, process at the point of sale. Could maybe be also be extremely uh, of an increased relevance within this Corona crisis, where you maybe don't want, and maybe, where you maybe want to speed up the, the the process at the point of sale and limit the amount of of time that people are waiting in a queue for uh, to buy something. Now, and once you once somebody purchased that item, the last read point typically in the store could be uh, an RFID based EAS system. So you have an RFID reader that you can see in this picture on the on the top. Uh, uh, above the exit, uh, that RFID reader will check which are the items that are leaving the store. Uh, and once an item is leaving the store, you will check the status in your EPCS repository 
If it's sold, you will not alarm. If it's unsold, the system will generate an alarm. So these are some of the common read points within the, in the, in the retail supply chain. And again, it's very valuable to map that in the EPSS repository and provide that transparency in the journey of that item throughout your supply chain. So Pete, if you would look at those use cases, what do you uh, think that retailers should keep in their mind when they are selecting their label? Well, it's a truism that for RFID, bigger is very often better. Um, first thing you should be looking is obviously what products am I applying it to? Some materials such as denim absorb a lot of moisture and we often uh, advise that that you use a slightly larger tag that's resilient to the detuning effect of the moisture in the in the garment and this is where functions like uh, auto tune really help us in uh, in the tag design what are the merchandising densities like in the store and in the stock room how are you going to use the tag are your as you've mentioned are, you, are your vendors going to do scan and pack at the point of shipment um, are you receiving them in into the DC, packed in cases, running through an RFID tunnel, how fast is that conveyor going? All these things will impact potentially the tag you should be using. You know, if you're receiving crates on, on rolling rails um, into the store, or are, you, or are you just reading it when it's merchandised on the shelf? Um, today, it's true to say that uh, very often the first time an RFID tag is ever read is when it reaches the store. So there's enormous supply chain opportunity uh, to open up still for a lot of retailers. And, and I'd ask that everyone, you know, uh, absolutely needs to think through exactly how they might use the tag, uh, not just today, but tomorrow as well. You know, and if you have high levels of, of theft, you might, you might want to think about sewing the tag into your garment. And as, as Hilbert alludes to, using it as an EAS device. So we have some common footprints of inlays in the market, 30 by 50 and 70 by 14, um, which are commonly used in denim and outerwear. And then we can often go smaller on intimates and accessories. Um, your, your, your existing label sizes may need to change a little. Um, RFID tends to be narrow and wide um, and it can impact the um, the shape and size of your label and ticket. If you use um, metalized packaging for blocking, you know, it's often an aluminium base and that would uh, retune your antenna completely. So we'd need to look at that. Small amounts highlighting on, on text, there's normally nothing, nothing to worry about. And as mentioned already, you, you'll sometimes need uh, on metal tags uh, for tins, if you've got any, say aerosols and things like that. Um, but we can often get around it with by using um, you know swing tickets on threads and things like that uh, because they're 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 low cost for sure. Okay. So uh, where should you start tagging for for proof of concepts where you might just do uh, a single store with a limited range of merchandise, tag it in the store, do 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 your mock-ups, do your tests, do your, do your proof of concept and understand you know, which tags are right for you. Um, for pilot, when you go to three to five stores, you know, we definitely recommend that, that, that you move to the DC to do that tagging simply because they have more space and they're more used to doing those kinds of processes. Um, and then we'd also need a, a store tagging party to tag up the merchandise uh, in the store. Um, we only call it a party, so people think it will be fun. Um, and the, the only thing that it has in common really with a party is it finishes late. Um, we also recommend that you, you use um, the RFID logo um, because it, it prevents double tagging. So if the DC's tagged, it arrives into the store, the store staff can see that tag and know not to put a, an additional one on. Uh, so the DC would often use a process called scan and print. We scan the existing barcode, print it, kicks out a new variable data point of sale label and that's applied on top of the current label because often there's not enough space to put an additional blank label um, and the store for their tagging party and and maybe some ad hoc uh, printing they could use a plain label uh, to manage you know store returns and things like that but again we often use uh, scan and print 
in the store. And then for the full deployment phase, uh, products would then be source tagged by your vendors. Um, and there'd be a change of garment trim, and uh, which would specify the RFID version of the label or ticket. Uh, tags typically ordered via an online portal. And um, if you're doing uh, fashion lines, they're typically best launched at the beginning of a new season. So 100% of that merchandise comes through tag. But for flow lines, basics, which flow from season to season, um, you know, and these tend to be your, your least accurate stocks, um, you know, the vendors need to uh, bring out their dead, ship the old merchandise out to you uh, first, first of all, and then um, as the um, RFID tag merchandise comes through, they should be labeling the boxes with, you know, kind of RFID inside stickers on those boxes. The DC comes, sees it coming in. And when, when the sort of critical mass reaches 70, 80% in the DC where they're shipping to the store, uh, 70 to 80% tagged, then um, they should be tagging 100% for the store and the store should go live and we should, we should do a tagging party in the store and, and, and get it live. Um, at that point of source tagging, we're also seeing more and more retailers asking us to put uh, print QR barcodes uh, on, which has, also has the EPC data inside, because um, it gives the consumer a, a very simple and easy way to link to the product, be that for things like self-checkout um, or, or other recommendations and understanding more about the product in store. So Hilbert, um, what else should our colleagues here be thinking about when they're starting on their RFID journey or who've already started it? Um, what else should they be doing? Yeah, so, at, so, so let's add that if you are considering to start an RFID project, I think the first thing you want to do is identify the use case that will bring your ROI. And I think that should really uh, um, um, bring focus to you, to your product and your organization. Um, and uh, we believe that in order for your RFID project to, to become successful, to focus on that use case first and that use case only. So I think uh, RFID has really cool benefits of shiny RFID mirrors and, and all these, these cool stuff that you can do with the technology. But in the end, most retailers see the, the biggest ROI coming from the stock accuracy. So the suggestion is that we have, that the advice that we would give you is to start with that use case before you start adding those cool other use cases. So when you're thinking about then selecting that label um, for that pre rollout, it is less, uh, uh, less critical. So you just want to make sure that the label that you pick is the right label for that use case that you want to start with. And at the moment you're starting to thinking about source tagging, then the label choice that you're, the, the label that you're picking, the label that you're cho choosing becomes more important. Because at that moment, you don't want to only think about the use cases that you're deploying at that moment, but you also want to think about the use cases that you have in the future, for, that you're thinking about for your future. So for instance, what I have seen is that retailers want to uh, adopt uh, a QR code or a 2D data matrix on the label and read the, read the EPC, read the RFID content using that QR code, but they only realize that when the tagging is already done and then you need to add it and then wait typically 12 to 18 months before that, that those labels have run through your entire organization and before all labels in the store have that QR code. Um, if you want to add a new use case like RFID based EAS, you want to make sure that the label that you're choosing today uh, uh, has that sensitivity so you can then add EAS maybe in one or two years after your initial deployment. So I think it's really good to create focus in the beginning, but make sure that the label that you're choosing is ready for the use cases that you want to unlock at the later stage. So I hope that was helpful. I already saw some questions also coming in regarding this topic. So I hope that, that answered that question. Um, at, but I also think this brings us to the end of the, uh, the webinar. Uh, but before we end, I think Madeline has a, a final poll for you all. Yes, thank you, Albert. So I'd like to ask everyone on the webinar this morning to answer the final question, which is launched on your screen. Now the question is, which use case is a driver for RFID source tagging in your organization? 
So what is your biggest reason to start source tagging and look into RFID tagging? And your options are supply chain transparency, so that source to store we we're talking about earlier, increase in inventory accuracy, is it to increase your on-shelf availability and make sure that your customers are never missing the sale? Or is it to enable omni-channel, to be able to sell on many different channels in a seamless fashion to support the customer's ambitions to buy your product? I'll give you guys just a couple more seconds. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and show you guys the results. So it looks like 35% of you are mostly looking into enabling omni-channel. Um, this is very consistent with what we noticed from the live webinar yesterday as well. And it's also consistent with the conversations we're having. Especially coming out of this corona crisis, we realize that there will be a need to support customers that want to shop from a distance and be able to pick up their products within the same day. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for participating and joining in on today's webinar and answering our polls. Just briefly want to say again, if you have questions that are coming up, please drop them into the Q&A box now. We will move into Q&A in a moment. But just some quick promo for some activity coming up. On the 28th of May, we have a webinar on how to reopen your store safely with store occupancy. And then on the 9th of June, we are hosting a webinar on sustainability in retail. So this is a topic that we touched upon within uh, today's webinar. And if you're interested in joining, this is gonna be on our website. You can sign up via resources and then webinar. And again, this recording will be posted there as well.